Good morning. It's uh, awesome to be at McDermott Road. So glad that y'all are, are here uh, today. All right, so if I were to ask you this morning as we get started, what is your top priority as a parent? Right? What is your top priority as a parent? Um, I think the fact that you are here this morning tells me what your top priority as a parent is, but we would get some different types of things, different types of answers, such as that our kids are safe and secure, that our kids are maybe healthy, that they are happy, that they are successful in their life, in their whatever success looks like, their relationships, their careers, uh, maybe that they are popular and well-liked. But I hope that we would all say and I've got two grown kids and a son-in-law, my prayer and my hope for my kids is that they will someday go to heaven. I mean, that, that is what my goal is, and I think that is in large part what our, our purpose is um, and our role as parents. And so this morning as we speak about the topic of good and what it means to raise uh, children that are maturing in Christ, I hope we can uh, sort of tag off of uh, what Dr. McDowell was discussing with uh, the good life and just look at this concept of what, what goodness really is and how we can move forward with that. And so I'd like to start out with some very uh, depressing statistics. <laughs> and so uh, let's, let's take a look at what the, the latest stats say. All right, so 90% of, of parents say that passing down faith is important. And so that's, that's great. Thumbs up for that. 90% of parents believe that their child will have a strong faith in college. Great. But only a third of those parents will actually speak with their child about Bible or faith outside of the church building. Only 12% of teens regularly talk with their parents about uh, just life in, in general. Um, 5% will talk with their father about life in general. That's not even speaking about spiritual life, just life, right? 9% experience reading the Bible regularly at home, and 12% have experienced an active faith or servanthood with their parents, all right? So that comes from, those stats come from a book called Owning Faith. I have a chapter in that, but it came out um, some of you might know Dudley Chansey um, at Oklahoma Christian. He put out that a book called Owning Faith. And um, it's written for parents, right? And all these chapters on, on uh, parenthood and how to have children that own their faith, that develop into uh, truly their own faith. So I encourage you to get your hands on that, that book. It's a good one. Children are going to mimic their parents, though. And they're going to mimic the degree of urgency that parents show for the kingdom of God. Um, we're going to really camp out on that theme this morning. And so while we do teach children about the urgent need to work in the kingdom, in our, our youth ministries, and our Bible school programs, and I'm wondering, any Sunday school teachers in here? Some good. Anyone in here work with a youth program somewhere? I know Brandon for sure. He better be raising his hand. West Freeway and, and others. All right. So working with youth programs and, and that's great, but we should also we should also be teaching our children not only through these formalized uh, types of, of gatherings, but just through more conversations and, and relationships that we have with them so that they develop really a, a greater sense of what it means to be a Christian. And not just a Christian, but a good Christian. So we'll look at what a good Christian really is about. But our culture is, is often getting the first word on important topics. So some of the topics that I deal with a lot in my counseling practice with teenagers are things like sexual identity issues, um, things um, maybe related to even uh, atheism or agnosticism that, that comes up. And the world often gets the, the first word on this, but our homes, the church and our homes need to be the first voice on those 
uh, those topics. At uh, Frieda Hardeman, I teach several classes. One of the classes is uh, Marriage and the Family. Marriage and the Family. It's a fun class. It's a, like a sophomore level class. And uh, in that class, about 40 students or so. And the other day, I was, um, I'm speaking about sexuality right now in the class. And by the way, none of the students want to make eye contact with me. It is great. All right, I'll call them out on it. But uh, in the class, about 42, I, I've, I've asked them, how many of you went to public school? And so more than half, probably two-thirds of the students raised their hand and went to public school. Great. How many of you uh, went to private schools? About, about uh, just a little less than a third, about 15, uh, 12 to 15 of the students raised their hand went to, to private school. How many of you were homeschooled? And there was about four or five that raised their hands that were homeschooled. So I asked them, how many of you in high school had some sort of sex ed program? Just about all the kids from public school raised their hand. One of the kids from the private school sector raised his hand. And so I'm wondering where in the world are our young people, especially those that are in maybe Christian schools, where are they learning about godly sex, right? And, and what that involves. Um, a couple of the homeschool uh, young people raised their hands that their parents had you know, gone through things with them. And then those that are in the public school, I'm wondering what are they being taught, <laughs> right? It's, it's definitely not abstinence and um, getting into some of those topics. So I hope that we as parents can speak to these topics with our children. I've got a slide here um, that differentiates between younger parents and older parents, all right? It's a little difficult to see, but starting out with the, the light blue, that's a percentage of younger parents age 18 to about 34, I believe, yes. And then the darker blue uh, bar, uh, bars on there are those that are 65 years of age and older. So look at some of the disparities of what's happening. And this is an American Enterprise Institute survey from 2019, so just a couple of years ago. And it sampled 2,561 adults age 18 and older that opted in for this uh, interview. The stats themselves tell us this, that younger parents, and I'm not talking here necessarily, but younger parents are less likely to participate, to participate in religious activities with their children, all right? Younger people, younger parents are less likely to send their children. Now, we don't want to send our children off to church, but back in the day, people would send their, their kids off. Maybe they wouldn't go. And so we see that big disparity between the previous generation and the current generation, and we wonder, why are our kids leaving the church? And um, I think it's kind of obvious why our kids are leaving the church. So another recent um, research by LifeWay shows that one of the first reasons that kids say we leave the church, didn't come back to the church, is we went off to college or I went and got a job, and so they got away from home, right? And no one was waking them up or saying, hey, you need to go to church, right? So that's the first reason. The second is they say the church members seem to be judgmental or hypocritical. And maybe they didn't really like the, the youth minister or in some cases youth pastor or family minister and just didn't see eye to eye. Maybe they felt that people in the pews and some of the leaders of the church were living a double standard. I've got to tell you something about Generation Z, and I work with Gen Z all the time, and some millennials, right? Gen Z cannot tolerate hypocrisy. They will tell you straight if you're being a hypocrite. They want, they want adults, they want leaders in uh, churches and in politics and in the community and in the home to be authentic, to be real, and to be consistent. Okay, they, they need that, and, and I appreciate Gen Z for being so honest. Some of them didn't feel connected to um, their church or the community of faith. Maybe it was a youth group they just didn't feel connected to for whatever reason. Some of them said that they disagreed with the congregation stance on political issues or social justice issues, and so they just felt that they were on a different, different page philosophically um, with, with their church home. And then others 
said that, hey, my work responsibilities kept me from um, going. And so you've got all these different stats up there. I'm not going to bore you too much more stats, a little bit more, though. Let's do the next one. Barna statistics. If this doesn't shake you, I don't know what will. This, this shakes me when I think about it. The statistics show this, that one out of nine young people, 11% uh, totally will lose their faith in Christianity. Those that, that, who were raised in the church, we're talking about, will totally lose their faith in Christianity. Four out of 10, so 40% will leave the church, but still call themselves Christians. I'm, I'm Christian philosophically, I just don't attend anywhere. Got you with me? Two out of 10, so 20%, will disconnect from the church and express um, some frustration with the, with the church and how it just doesn't seem relevant to, to the culture and the church culture itself. Again, maybe it feels hypocritical to them or just doesn't feel authentic enough. And then three out of 10, three out of 10 will stay involved in the church. Now, you know, Back in 2008, the same research was done. It was 60% would stay involved in church in 2008. 2016, now it's three out of 10. And so we boil that down, we're looking at 30%, only 30% of churched young people remain faithful to the church as they get older. We've got some issues to deal with. And it starts in the home, Certainly connected with the church. The church is to be supplementary. No youth minister is to be a surrogate parent or, or a, a family. Uh, no family minister is to, or spiritual formation minister is to be the, the replacement for the responsibility of parents. But yeah, only 30%. All right, so next slide. So what's the purpose of parenting? I love this uh, statement that comes from a textbook I'm using in my family ministry, it's a grad class, family ministry uh, class by Chris Shirley. And he says in his book, and it's a wonderful, wonderful book on family ministry, he says this, to, the purpose of parenting is to make disciples, our kids, to, to make disciples. Who will make disciples? And so we want to make disciples who will become disciple makers, who will fill the earth with God's glory. And I think he nailed it on the head. Why does God give us families? What's the purpose of families? Ultimately, it's to bring glory to God. And if we're not doing that in our homes, and if I'm not doing that in my home, I've, I've missed the boat on why I'm a father, why my wife is a mother, why we started a family to bring Glory to God. By the way, both of our kids are adopted, and uh, we're so blessed to be adoptive parents. Now I've grown uh, children, and to have that, that tight bond, and we think about how the Lord has adopted us into his family, right? And there's so many scriptures along those lines. And so let's get down to business. Are we raising good kids? Are we raising good kids? Hmm, that depends. What is good? All right, so we compare good or goodness. How do we define good and goodness? Part of the challenge that we have, even with this weekend, talking about the good life, I'm going to ask you quickly, how do some people in this world define being good? Let me, let me hear from you for a moment. To be good means what in our culture? This is where you speak. To be good means what? To be generous. A generous person is a good person. Sure, okay. How else? Compassionate. A compassionate person is a good person. To be tolerant, tolerant, acceptance, acceptance, everybody. Okay. Very tolerant, very accepting, except maybe open and affirming of different lifestyles or whatever it is, right? Just a very tolerant person is considered in our culture to be good. How else? To be a good person is to be what? Obedient? Okay. Obedient? Whether it's obedient to the law or maybe obedient to parents. Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's good. Were you, were you the one talking? Yeah. Okay, I couldn't tell the mask. All right. Okay, good. So, um, so yeah, so we've we got several different, different ideas 
And that would tie into this idea again of, of goodness. We throw around terms like this. We say, oh, he's a good guy. Or, oh, she's such a good girl. She's such a good girl. Or, man, good luck. Hope you have a good day. So the word good, we, we throw around so loosely that it's lost some of its original meaning. What does it really mean to be good? What does goodness really entail? Galatians chapter 5, verse 22 through 23, has the fruit of the Spirit of being born out. The fruit of the Spirit's love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Nine of them, right? Against such there is no law, Paul writes. So number six is to be good or to have goodness. In the Bible, goodness is equivalent to godliness. Goodness is godliness in the Bible. In our culture, goodness is not necessarily godliness. It could be, but it might involve other things, things that are maybe socially acceptable or culturally or politically correct are considered good in our, our culture. And so as we, we think about this and we think about how the Bible defines it, I'd like to turn for just a moment to Psalm 23. We were talking about um, the good life and the good shepherd from John 10 this morning. But in the 23rd Psalm, verse 6, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, I used to always think about this idea of goodness following me, that uh, my life's going to be good. Um, good things are going to happen to me. But right? if, if, if the Lord's my shepherd, good things will happen to me. Is that always true? No. John 16, 33, Jesus said in this life, you will have trouble, but take heart, I've overcome the world. So, it's not, it's not necessarily that good things will always follow me as far as good happenings, but my relationship with Christ can be good and I can be secure in him because he is the good shepherd, right? And I can live a good life, not defined as the world defines it, but as how God defines it. So that goodness is not just what's happening to me, but who I am, who I am as a child of, of God. And so... God calls us to be filled with goodness from the inside out. And we're not just to do good works, because doing good works without a good heart is empty. It's hollow to do good things without having the right purpose. And so the goodness described in the scripture, as the slide says, is a fruit of the Spirit. It's not merely moral behavior. It's not just moral behavior, but it's excellence of character. We want to raise our kids to have an excellent character. And it's only possible, that sort of character, that sort of goodness is only possible through God's grace and through God's mercy. My kids needed a lot of grace and mercy because they had a very imperfect father. When I look in the mirror, I realize the mistakes I've made as a, as a parent Starting out as a new parent, I didn't know what I was doing. My wife didn't know what she was. She knew more of what she was doing than I knew what I was doing. I was a little less mature than she is. But we, we do trial and error and we make mistakes and, and we, we lean on the Lord to say, God, please help me raise good kids despite myself and the things that I do and say and the, the mistakes that I, that I make sometimes. Any of y'all make mistakes? No, none of y'all, I know. Um, and so this means that, you know, though God is good all the time, uh, that does not mean that our lives are always good, but that we're practicing this fruit of goodness. So we're going to have a little Greek study here. You've got a college professor, so we'll talk about Greek just for a moment. A couple of words that are key in the New Testament that the word good is often, but not always, but the word good comes from. The one is agathos. So we think about a, a woman called Agatha. Her name means good, right? Um, the, the other word is kalos in, in Koine Greek. And so maybe somebody called Kali. That kind of comes from this idea of, of a, a, a good person. So the Agathos refers to moral goodness. It's a concept of 
Goodness itself can be used in reference to the natures of people, much less commonly used of physical features like beautiful, that person really looks good. It's not really used in that way. So it's more abstract. And then kalos refers to, can refer to physical qualities. Oh, that's a good looking guy. That's a, what a good looking child you got, All right? So it could, it could speak to the, the physical characteristic, but it could also speak to qualities of objects. So we move a little bit further into this. Agathos, again, is the Greek for it. It's an adjective. It basically means to be intrinsically good. To be intrinsically good. All right? It's a very wide net cast with this word agathos. And as a believer, it describes what originates from God. It's God's goodness that we're reflecting. If we're the light of the world, we're reflecting God's goodness. And it's not only originating from God, but it's empowered by God. I'm not good enough to be good. I'm not good enough to be good. I need the Holy Spirit to empower me to be good, to live truly the good life, and to empower my children to be good, to really live a good life, to be good, godly people, all right? There's several verses tied into this, but in the NASB translation, Sometimes it's translated generous, good, good man, good things, goodness, uh, goods, kind, kindly, kindness. All these terms kind of come up. I'm going to throw up several verses up here so we can do that quickly. These are some verses that use that particular term, agathos, right? It's translated good. So Matthew 5, 45, evil and good, he sends a rain. Um, I'm going to skip around here. Uh, Matthew 7, 17, so every tree bringeth forth, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, right? The last there uh, brings out of his good treasure, Matthew 12, 35, continues. So what good thing shall I do, Matthew 19, 16, um, down in Matthew 25, well done, good and faithful servant, agathos, good and faithful servant. Um, the good soil, Luke 8, and honest and good heart, Luke 8, 15. So that's all agathos, all right? Let's go on to the next one. Kalos. Beautiful, uh, good, outward sign of an inward good, perhaps. So excellent, um, worthy, sound, commendable. Something is more preferable. It's better than something else. It's, it's gooder, right? It's more preferable noble, to, and to be seen as, as such. These are all kind of usage of this, this term, this, this uh, word, Greek word, kalos, right? Several verses that go with it, talking about bearing good fruit in uh, Matthew 3, 18. Um, they may see your good works, Matthew 5, 16. Tree bears good fruit. So this time, uh, in Matthew, unlike Luke, he, they, the writer, uh, Matthew, uses the word kalos, Make the tree good and its fruit good. Uh, Matthew 13, 8, fell onto good ground. Talk about the, the, the parable of the, the sow and the seed. Um, down in uh, 13, 45, Matthew, seeking goodly, I like the, the KJV version, goodly pearls, all right? It comes from that, that uh, word. Um, it's not good to take uh, bread from the children um, she's done a good deed, Matthew 26 uh, and um, verse 10. All right. So, all these things related to goodness. Oh, man. How do we, how do we combat the, the, the culture of the world? How do we help our kids to become good kids? God the kids. What are we up against? These are the five deadly S's <laughs> I can think about. Uh, social media, numero uno, uh, social media. As kids get values and they compare themselves to what goodness looks like or what beauty is supposed to look like. Secular humanism, sensuality. We live in such an over-sexualized culture. Kids these days are exposed to sexuality at a far younger age, even through cartoons. Right? And Disney, even these days, they're, they're, they're things that you've got to watch and be careful with and censor. Selfishness, 
We live in a pervasively selfish culture. A lot of marriages don't make it because of selfishness, essentially. One of the greatest gifts that you can give your children is to love their mama, or if you're a lady, love their father. That's one of the greatest gifts you can give to your kids. And sensationalism, and so I mean by that kind of a feel-good type of religion that's not very substantive, but it makes me feel good. But maybe there's really no commitment and no discipleship and no sacrifice uh, that goes with that. So we're up against all of that as parents. And so every day, both we and our children are bombarded in this very hedonistic, evil culture in which we, we live. Is America a, um, uh, is this a, a Christian nation? No. We might, we like to think that it is, but no. It's not a, we, we are, we're the anomaly, right, as believers. And so we, we, we look on, and Ephesians 6, 10 through 12, the whole armor of God. Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. The whole armor of God. You may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil, because we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against rulers and authorities, against cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. And so we're in a battle. It goes on and talks about what, what comes next in your Bible after that. What the, what's described in verse 13 on? You better read your Bible. The armor, right? So it describes a helmet of truth, the breastplate, you know, um, of righteousness, and on and on, the sword of the, sword of the spirit, Right? Over my life, I've heard so many sermons and lessons on that text, but something I'd never noticed about that text was the context of that text. Read back a little bit. Chapter 5 and the beginning of, of chapter 6 of Ephesians. What's it talking about? It's talking about families. It's talking about mothers and fathers and husbands and wives and even in that case, because of that culture, it, talks, it goes on and talks about slaves who are part of households. But the context is the household, right? Right before it speaks about the household, by the way, since I'm on a, on a um, going down this road for a moment, verse 17 or so to about verse 21, what's it talking about there? It's talking about worship. And there's some of the verses we get about a cappella music, right? And well, maybe misapplied to a degree, but, but we take the, those verses from there and, and use them. And I think they're good verses on singing and making melody in our heart and the church context. So you've got worship, boom, immediately after that, families. And immediately after that, the whole armor of God. Do you think that's just... Uh, luck, dumb luck, that uh, Paul wrote it that way? No. It's inspired. Right? And so we, the, we see the family, and we need to couch the family and our households and our parenting within the context of worship, and then within the context of battling against this culture, and the need for the whole armor of God. So think about the context of what we're, what we're reading there. It's very, very powerful. All right? So your children's spiritual development should be our most important concern. So this focuses on matters as our children becoming Christians, them showing a genuine interest in the church, um, spending eternity in heaven. John H. Westerhoff, who taught at Duke for a number of years and was involved in spiritual formation at Duke, he talk, uh, talked about three different levels of faith. Actually, in his original iteration of this, he had four different levels of faith, but then he simplified it down in his book in 1980. And the, the original book was called Will Our Children Have Faith? All right? Step number, number one is affiliative faith. Affiliative faith is what they inherit from us as parents or what they just kind of get sort of through osmosis because they go to church and they see things, and so they just like, well, that, that's got to be true. And so they just sort of buy into it, but, but it's a shallow faith. 
That's what they can do at a young age. So it's because of, of affiliation. All right? Paul, writing to Timothy, says that he knows of the faith that lived in his grandmother and his mother, Lois and Eunice, and now is convinced is in him as well, right? So it starts in the parents, goes on next to a searching faith. When do, when do people start searching faith, really? Adolescence. 12 years old, 13 years old, upwards of emerging adulthood, it's 18 to 25. I've got young people at Frieda Hardeman that are, you know, they've come from very, cons often from very conservative backgrounds, some not. But they're searching and they're asking all types of questions. What's my job as a, a mentor, as a professor, as a discipler? My job is to listen, to not cast judgment on them, to allow them a safe environment to try out their wobbly faith, because their faith is wobbly right now. And I encourage them, don't, don't throw the baby out to the bathwater. Don't throw out everything you ever learned. But let's think about what you've learned, and let's think about it more critically. Let's think about these things more critically. And so that searching faith, and then finally, an owned faith comes beyond adolescence and often beyond college. Um, it's more secure, it's, it's, it's owned. It's what, what somebody really believes in. Now, those of you that are my age, I'm 53, all right, do I believe everything exactly the same way as my parents believe? No. I believe a lot of what they believe, but my faith has to be my faith, right? Philippians 2 tells us we've got to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. And so we bring our kids, we give them all the tools they need to reach that level of a mature faith. And so let's go on, all right? How would you raise, par as parents, raise faithfully mature kids in a faithless and corrupt world? How do we teach them to be in the world but not of the world? John 15 and John chapter 17. There's a couple more stats here I just want you to think about, especially the role of fathers. Just put that up there. Just back up for a second. Back up for a second. Faith is often more caught than it's taught, right? So one of my favorite stories is a, a uh, lady uh, from Nashville, a congregation in Nashville. She told the story about how she and her younger sister, when they were little kids, every night, their dad or their mom or both would lay them down to bed, go to sleep. And what they would do is, um, after the parents thought they were asleep, they would get up out of bed and they would crawl down the hallway and listen in to their parents praying beside the bed at night. They would watch their parents praying on their knees every night by the bed. The parents had no idea that they were watching them. And they would hear their parents praying for the church, for sick people, for, um, for their daughters to meet godly husband someday, for them to be raised to be Christians. This lady said that one of the most single, most powerful influence in her life was nothing that her parents ever directly said to her, but what she observed her parents doing in their prayer life as a couple when they had no idea that they were being watched. That's powerful. Faith is more often caught through observation, vicarious, and then it's actually taught, all right? You can teach your kids, you can try to cram the Bible down their throat all you want, but unless you're living it, good luck. One thing that a kid can spot a million miles away, and that is a hypocrite. Kids are smart. They can tell if there's a disconnect, and so we've got to be authentic in our faith, all right? So, so you have some stats um, on spiritual influence of parents. All right. So if a father does not go to church, so listen to this, all right? If a father does not go to church, even if his wife does go to church, one in 50 kids will become faithful worshipers. That's according to Promise Keepers and Baptist Press. All right. 
If a father does go to church regularly, irrespective of whether his, the wife, the mother goes or not, between two-thirds and three-quarters of the kids, when they grow up, will be faithful in their church attendance. If that same father attends church irregularly, he goes, but it's irregular, between half and two-thirds of the kids will probably attend church with some irregularity when they're older. If a mother does not go to church, but a father does, right, a minimum of two-thirds of the children will grow up, end up attending church. Contrast. I'm going to flip the last bullet up there. If a father does not go to church, but the mother does, on average, two-thirds of their kids will not attend church. So what does this say? Mother's influence is big. As far as the kids' future church attendance, and that's not the only litmus test for faithfulness. I, I get that, right? But it's a, a big one. But the da a dad's impact. Raise your hand if you're a dad. Man, we got some huge responsibility on our shoulders, brothers. Our impact, our spiritual example is huge. It's so very, very important. Now, we've got some single mothers probably here, and I appreciate single moms, and I, I work with single moms. It's an uphill battle, and you've got to try to do both sometimes, be mom and dad, right? It's, it's such a challenge. But the apple doesn't fall too far from the tree. And so Moses, he gives instructions in Deuteronomy 4, 6 through 9. So I'm going to turn there in my Bible. This is the Shema. Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4 through 9. And um, I would try to read it without my glasses, but I would be deceiving myself to try to read it without my glasses. So here we go. Deuteronomy 6, starting verse 4. Here, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. And these words that I command you today shall be on your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children. You shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign between your hand, and they shall be as frontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. So, as we think about the importance of that particular text, we talk about the Bible with our kids when we sit at home with them. When we walk along the road or drive in the car, and I about had an accident driving in Fort Worth traffic yesterday. It was close. But when we're driving in the car, when our kids are driving, when they get older, that, that brings about a lot of prayer, too. Uh, I've thought about that, teaching them to drive, especially in this type of traffic. When we lie down at night, bedtime, when we get up first thing in the morning, maybe around the breakfast table, it's part of the, the fabric of life. Not just what happens on Wednesdays and Sundays or whatever other midweek services. It's the fabric of everyday life. And it starts in the home. Psalm 119 verse 9. How can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your word. So the aim of spiritual formation, I use this cross acronym, it's basically developing a cross-shaped, a cross-shaped or cruciform life in ourselves and in our children. So the cross is God's calling card, right? The cross was God's calling card. To be a disciple, we're to pick up our own cross, we're told, all right, to follow Christ. And so think about a couple of verses tied to this, and then I'll look at a cross acronym with you for a moment. In uh, 1 Corinthians 2, verse 1 and 2, Paul says, And when I came to you, brothers, I did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom, for I decided to know nothing among you except what? Christ and him crucified. So Paul preached the cross. Let's take a look in the Galatians passage. Galatians 6.14, but far be it for me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world, all right? So 
True discipleship should, should occur again in the shadow of the cross. So let's think about this cross acronym, C-R-O-S-S. -S. When it comes to our kids, there's got to be cognitive engagement. In other words, we've got to connect with their minds. Uh, that's the first place we connect, with their minds, with their brains, with their, their thinking. This is Christ-like thinking to develop the mind of Christ. The R is relationships, especially one-on-one -on -one types of relationships. So this is Christ-like connecting. We want our kids to be connected to us, but all the stats out there, stats like to Kara Powell and her book, Sticky Faith, from Fuller Youth Institute and Fuller Theological in Pasadena, their research shows that every kid, they need to have at least five adults external to the parents, really, but five adults that are mentors to them. And this is intergenerationally. That is so key that they are being mentored, that they have these relationships, right? Not just their peers. That's important. That's great. But they need these one other relationships with people that are trusted adults that they can go to when they've got questions, especially if it's on a topic they're not comfortable talking to mom or dad about, all right? The O is one-on-one -on -one mentorship, and so that's Christ-like modeling. And it has to do with, again, this idea of discipleship. So one-on-one -on -one mentorship, every kid needs a mentor. S, spiritual disciplines. So prayer, fasting, meditation, all those things connected to the spiritual disciplines. Christ-like growing, that's key. And how do kids pick that up often by watching their parents? What are we doing? Do we, are we exercising spiritual disciplines in our life? Then the final S is service opportunities, which is Christ-like doing. I've loved taking kids on mission trips with their parents, too. Uh, one of my good friends, uh, uh, Jeff Smith, who's there's several Jeff Smiths I've noticed, but Jeff Smith at Sunset in Lubbock, he directs a program called Disciple Trips and partners with congregations and takes... Um, people of all ages, you know, on different mission trips. But it's great when you see intergenerational connection on those trips and serving and growing together. And so these are essential. All right, I've got just a couple more minutes here. I'm going to fly through it. So how do we go about fostering this goodness, righteousness, and true holiness? I think I've got several verses that are supplied for you, I believe. And so you can go look at these. But goodness must be taught. All right. Godliness, godly goodness must be taught. I'm just going to read one verse from each of the different points. Ephesians 6, 4. Fathers, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. All right. Other verses on there. We can use the edge model for teaching our kids. E, explain it to them. D, demonstrate it to them. G, guide them as they're trying to live good, live a good life. Provide that guidance, come alongside of them. And then E, empower them or enable them to do it by themselves. All right? Edge, E-D-G-E. -E. So goodness must be taught, goodness must be sought. We've got to seek after it. We've got to help our kids seek after it. Matthew 5, 6, just that first. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after what? Righteousness. Well, they shall be what? Filled. All right. Matthew 6.33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added to you. And other verses that speak about, again, the mind, Colossians 3, put our mind on higher things. Okay? Next. Goodness must be thought. So it's a diligent Bible study. Psalm 1, 1 and 2. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers, but his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, and hearing through the word of Christ. And many, many other scriptures that we can read, we can memorize with our kids, have a competition. My family used to play Bible baseball. If you remember that game, but 
We would challenge each other just for Bible knowledge. It was great. It was fun. But we learned through it. Goodness must be thought. Do you have all those verses provided in the handout? Good. Okay, so you can read those on your own time. Good little Bible study with your family. Go on. Goodness must be fought for. All right. Goodness must be fought for. And so, again, in Ephesians 6, 12 to 13, it tells us we're not fighting against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities. 1 Timothy 6, 12, fight the good fight of faith. Lay hold of eternal life to which you were called. That's so many other verses speak about the fight for our faith, the fight for our kids' souls, as we encourage them to fight the good fight of faith. And then goodness must be wrought. In other words, it's brought about through discipline. Our discipline of them and the Lord's discipline of us and of them. Discipline is an essential foundation for discipleship. Fathers, Ephesians 6, 4, do not provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. Hebrews 12 speaks about discipline as God disciplines us. We discipline our kids. All right. Goodness cannot be bought, though. It fits all these other things. So the next slide as we summarize. It must be taught, must be sought, must be thought, must be fought, must be wrought, but can't be bought because goodness is holistic and holy in nature. As we wrap up, Jesus, Luke 12, Luke 2 is a 12-year-old. Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. So what sort of growth was that for him? Let's take a look and see. He grew intellectually, he grew physically, he grew spiritually, he grew socially. I couldn't resist. He grew into a good boy in the true sense of what it means to be good. Let's raise our kids to be good boys and girls. We're done. Thank you very much. Sorry I've, I'm rushing like drink from a fire hose. Uh, we're dismissed for a break until the next session. Thank you.